Okay, so uh, welcome back. Here we are talking about uh, chapter four, viewing and navigation. Now that we have the, the basics of binding squared away, we are going to uh, uh, look at viewpoints. And viewpoints are uh, very important uh, capability for your scene because what they do is they help the end user see what are what is available in your scene where should they go how should they look at it uh, what are the different angles that make sense what are the vantage points to see animation going and then last but not least the description the the short pithy uh, uh, one-liner about what are they looking at okay so viewpoints are very helpful and uh, There's a conceptual thing that you want to uh, keep in mind here that I, I think will help you visualize just how a viewpoint works. Is As we build these models, as we have in the first chapters of constructing geometry and putting it in place and rotating it and getting it positioned just so for where it should be, uh, you could think of that since it's in a fixed coordinate system, x, y, z, set an arbitrary origin as being a place, being something that exists in, exists in, uh, in three-dimensional space. And then what we're doing with a viewpoint is putting little cameras into that space to look at it from different angles and say, these are the vantage points you care most about. Given that you have these different vantage points then, navigation or the act of how do I explore is greatly simplified. Your, your most accessible navigation is simply going through the viewpoints in the order perhaps that you suggest, in the order that the user decides they want to go through based on the descriptions you've provided. A nice embellishment on this as, as we learn to animate is that we can also take our camera positions, our viewpoints, and animate those. So it might not be just the geometry that's moving or changing, it could be our view. And sometimes we do that very uh, simply. What we'll do is, um, uh, if we have an object that's moving through the scene, perhaps it's doing something, a car or a plane, perhaps it's interacting, we'll often give viewpoints that are relative to that, sort of an over the shoulder shot. So as it is moving around through the scene, we're right there with it. And we can go with it and say, oh, if we were on that thing, that's what it would look like. Or wait a minute, maybe I want to see that thing going by. Or maybe I want to get high above and look down on top of the scene and see what it is. So uh, these are the options at your disposal. This is, this is your palette, your offering palette, if you will. So uh, I'd like to point out that this is one of the, the best parts of 3D, is you get viewpoint independence. As the author, you've, you've got the biggest say in where can the end user go, and then they'll elaborate on your themes, they'll, they'll uh, play off of that. It's also uh, one of the major advantages compared to video. When you watch video, especially very good video, uh, like uh, uh, last Thursday while in DC, I went to see uh, The Dark Knight, the Batman. Has, has anybody here seen that? A few of you. There's a lot of pretty exciting camera work in there. And uh, uh, my wife always hates it when I talk about this, but it's fun to think about the camera work and what they're doing and what they're implying inside a scene. And, and usually you don't bother with any of that. You're just suspending disbelief. You're watching the action unfold. And they've carefully constructed every single frame that you look at to paint a picture to tell a story. So it's almost nonsensical to go, whoa, what's over there? Or, or what am I missing right now? You know, it's probably some guy holding a boom mic or, or something like that. But, but really, you, in your mind's eye, you've already filled that in. And the camera moving around is as if you were exploring a lot of these scenes. So uh, in 3D, we're not just filming a storefront, 
or a fake front to a building, we're building the whole world and then saying the camera can take us anywhere we want to go. So uh, it's very interesting to uh, take advantage of that because it's, it's part of what makes 3D more powerful, also less bandwidth if you can make it go. You know, a great video, of course, tells uh, uh, at least a thousand words, but you can only see what you've been shown. In 3D, you can go somewhere else. If you do want to look at that uh, movies as an exemplar for uh, viewpoints, then I recommend uh, you go a second time. <laughs> Enjoy the story the first time, then watch it a second time and say, how did they put this together? Why did they take this view? What's going on here? You can learn some good insights for yours. Okay, so let's drill down into the node then. This viewpoint node, what's it talking about? Well, most obvious is position in the 3D world, and then the orientation of the camera, what it's looking at. And our default position is chosen to work well with our default geometry. You know, most of it's uh, a meter wide. 10 meters seem to be a good distance. I guess a, a sphere would be a little small at a one meter radius, but still visible. Um, so we always try to pick safe default so that if you just drop it in, you'll get something and then you can improve it. The key to the position at 10, 10 meters out from the origin is the direction. And I guess people's natural inclination is to think that, well, if we've gone out from 0 to 10, we're moving along that z-axis, as we've described, then that would be the direction we're looking. But if you're on the 10 meters out and looking out along the z-axis, you're probably looking at nothing because uh, if you just built a small world and you're giving it a little viewpoint, uh, you're not going to put that out somewhere on the z-axis. You're going to put it right at the origin because that's the most natural place for it. That's the most repositionable location when you decide to take your model and put it into something else. So this is why the orientation field goes not along the z-axis, but on the negative z-axis, looking back in towards the origin. And since that's our default, that means that's our starting point when we change the viewpoint orientation. Okay, so this is definitely counterintuitive because it's different than what you might expect. Everything else in Transform, where you're rotating, you rotate it to the angle you want it to be. And that's based on a zero rotation, x, y, z orientation at the origin. But the viewpoint is the one thing that's flipped around from that. So instead of saying, when we have an orientation value in there, what direction is it pointed at? That would be the wrong question. The right question would be is, where is my orientation shifting me from? If I've started out by looking at the origin, then my orientation change is the difference in that direction. Okay, so when you get that down, then suddenly orientation will start making a lot more sense. Otherwise, you'll find yourself, I never seem to get my viewpoint orientation right. Okay, if you're in that mode, then rethink it. You're looking towards the origin and you're changing that. Okay, now description. It's, it's always kind of funny to me. Uh, uh, you see a lot of people doing this building scenes where their description field is blank. Or it just says, you know, something obscure like a coordinate or plus x or uh, something meaningless. Every time you write a description, you, sh you should say, this is my memo to the end user. What are you supposed to be seeing right now? It's like a bookmark in that you can go there and it tells you the name of the view. And so this is why uh, descriptions are, are really very important. They're really for others. It's, it's part of how you tell the story. Okay. So some of the hints we have in here, uh, uh, naming of descriptions, uh, 
make it understandable. If you're using jargon or abbreviations, it probably won't be understood. Okay, uh, uh, just around here, just, just here today, we have an international group in the room. Uh, you've seen it just from people in different communities in yours where just because you abbreviate it one way doesn't mean somebody else abbreviates it that way. In fact, they'll think of it differently. So that's why we avoid that. Try to get clear. A good way to test is give your scene to somebody else. Say, so you get it? Does it make sense? You could also say, did they get it without your explaining it? And they just go, oh, yeah, yeah, I got this and that. Hey, I didn't know that before. What about this other thing? And then you go, oh, good, they got it. The description made sense. Okay. Um, some people get into the business of thinking a viewpoint description is the same as the DEF name, the EF, the, the label on it. They're not. So you, you can use spaces, you can use exclamation points or punctuation, whatever you want. Make a simple sentence. And then... Uh, the viewpoint list is how the uh, browsers expose it to people. All right, now we have some, some more uh, esoteric, or uh, shall we say, lesser used fields that sometimes might be valuable. And so field of view is the typical width of a screen. And people typically don't bother with this because they just don't think about it. They don't want to. And uh, that's okay. We picked a, a, a value that works on most scenes where they seem pretty natural. But uh, in fact, how many people here, when you've looked at 3D scenes up till now, have you thought about how wide is my field of view? Okay, one, maybe two, yeah. Um, okay, so now let's look at this thing. 45 degrees. How big is that? Well, half of 90 degrees okay so there so all right so there's my field of view uh, not very wide is it 45 degrees if, if uh, each of us had to walk around with 45 degree field of view glasses we'd probably be stumbling into a lot of things all right so oh gee it's very narrow and I never noticed that before possibly significant. So, so that is telling you that your camera, the picture you're showing people is, since it's narrow, you want it to be focused on the objects that matter. You want to be generous in your use of viewpoints so they can get a sense of looking around. It might lead you to say, oh, I, I wasn't going to, but now I will give a top-down view so they get a sense of the surroundings maybe a little better than I can show. And then finally, uh, uh, you could uh, adjust it to uh, uh, match a different field of view if you needed to. So let's, let's take a look at an example here. All right, so I'm going to pull up the... Uh, Kelp Forest exhibit. Because there's a particular viewpoint I'd like to see. And I think uh, for now I'm just going to go right to the website for this. Okay, here's the project page for the uh, Kelp Forest exhibit. This is uh, separate than the version that's in the book. But if you want to read the history of how we put this together, it's pretty interesting. It was actually um, a pair of classes. One was the beginning uh, X3D class. We were using Vermal way back then. And then the other class was a physically based modeling class where we put stuff together. So let's call it up. And uh, this is coming down off the server now. You can see it's reasonably peppy. Here's our viewpoint list. When I click on that, we go, oh, OK. Gee, lots of viewpoints. And they're reasonably descriptive. It looks like they're mostly fish or someplace in the tank. Let's, let's look at our entry viewpoint. That's what was called Q 
Kelp Forest, Monterey Bay Aquarium. Okay, so pretty good entry name. It's almost like a topic sentence in a paragraph. It's telling you, you are here. This is your location. Then let's, let's look at this viewpoint before we explore around a little bit. Okay, we've got a nice little sign here, text. Oh yeah, text node, we know how to do that already. And uh, it says, find charts, see new viewpoints. Press page down, wait, and watch. When we did this, originally it was back in 1998, 10 years ago. And uh, 3D was uh, uh, certainly newer then than it is now. And what we were preparing this for was a big event out in town, uh, the Oceans uh, 1998 conference, a national conference that had about uh, 500 people come. As part of that, they had uh, some demos uh, down at the uh, Custom House Plaza. So we said, well, let's, let's break out our $50,000 workstation and make a model here and let people view it. And so we had it projecting on a TV screen and we offered this to kids to come look at. So since navigation is kind of hard, here I am clicking it around and dragging it. You could say that, well, it wouldn't take long for a grade schooler to completely get lost in space or mix this up. So how do we make it so that we could go to a location and search around? So, that, so we said, ah, what we'll do is we'll give them we might not even be there when they come to see the demo. We'll say, hit the page down key, which is also synonymous with go to next viewpoint. And you can see as we do that, that going to next viewpoint, it's taking us through them one at a time and basically giving us a guided tour of the kelp forest. And each time we do that, on this particular screen, the uh, viewpoint list is right here on this browser. So we do have a descriptor on uh, what's going on that they can use to do it. So let's explore a little more. Once you get to the mouse and see that, you can uh, also go that, go through that. And so we have a pretty good view of kelp forest here. And we can go back and we can say, oh, what was I looking for? Uh, yeah, the side windows. What was there? Or maybe, oh no, I want to go back to the top. Okay, so here's a great example of a series of viewpoints that not only tell the story, but when ordered appropriately, take you through the, the larger scene. Okay, now as it turns out, it uh, might be nice if we had annotations to descriptions. Sometimes you want a longer story there. That's probably something we could engineer into the scene. We haven't yet. Maybe we will someday. But here are some of the uh, interesting things here. Uh, this pump house. Uh, let's get back here. See if I can reset it. Okay. Uh, how many of you have been to see the Kelp Forest exhibit downtown? Okay, a handful. And uh, have you ever been up topside to, to see what's there? You can also just about see this from below. The bird's eye view lets you uh, look at it. Something we haven't drawn in here yet, if you do go up topside and look at the bird's eye view where you have different lights and stuff like that is there's little wires all across the top, a mesh. Not too many, maybe about a dozen wires. Uh, anybody know why that is? Keep the birds out. Yeah, they like, uh, they like to go fishing there. Uh, so occasionally one will uh, sneak through, but it's a lot harder. The uh, pump house itself was interesting because uh, uh, most of the aquarium was funded by the uh, Packard Foundation. And David Packard of Hewlett Packard fame uh, actually uh, built the pump house 
or built this pump. It's a positive displacement pump in his, uh, up at his ranch. He had a forge up there and liked making things. He also has built a few other uh, items around, around there. You can also see that we have the water moving and the kelp moving. And this was a pretty tricky business because the pump is the primary thing that helps keeps uh, the water going. It is kelp forest, that's tidal. So they wanted a tidal action in there. There's some pumping and recirculating of water. All the water comes into the tank from the bay and back out again. So it's actually a very sophisticated environment. Uh, when you go back to uh, the original web page, it describes how students put this together, how they figured out what the flow was at different points in the kelp forest and made it work. So each of these fish and kelp are done by different people and uh, integrated in using the inline node, which we've also seen, and that's what led a, a class of students all work together. Now one of the students, uh, uh, well, let's see, I'm missing the viewpoint. I think there may be a problem with that scene. Uh, Here's, here's one student, uh, our advisor said, well, you do want to have some kind of indication that NPS did it, so we made two sharks here, Lefty and Lucy. That's, uh, that's an insider Navy joke uh, about valve turning, righty-tighty, lefty-lucy. Hey, I, I don't make them all up, I'm, I'm just telling them to you, you know. Uh, uh, but, uh, This is uh, an image texture pasted onto some geometry. See, some of it by today's standards is pretty rough. Back then it was uh, pretty cool. So on the one we uh, pasted uh, NPS text on the side. And uh, uh, well, there's our uh, shameless advertisement, I guess. No, no sharks, actual sharks were harmed during the making of this. Uh, but it's interesting to say, uh, well, uh, what would things look like from the perspective of a fish going in here? And so it is possible to uh, change the field of view and change the uh, angle of this thing to get a uh, much wider view. So uh, we haven't experimented much with this yet, but I think this would be a very interesting thing, is to do some experiments on really wide field of view display and see how effective, effective they were for uh, situational awareness type of things. In fact, I think for some 3D displays, we might want to do something like have the full up scene on top, and then on the bottom, a narrow strip, you might have a 180 degree or even a 360 degree view of what's around you as kind of an alertness thing. So, uh, gee, there's a good thesis topic, I or at least a good study topic for one of your classes. I haven't seen anybody do a formal study on that kind of thing. You can see a lot of games will put a little map in the corner, a top-down view with icons and such. And uh, maybe you guys can do it, I can't. I, uh, High school freshman son is very good at that kind of thing. Uh, watching the screen, seeing the little map in the peripheral vision and maintaining situational awareness. But it's definitely a acquired skill. It would be interesting if we could show the value and the best practices of field of view there. Okay, so let's pull up our viewpoint editor then. see pretty straightforward. Uh, there are all of our fields and we got a couple of more so let's go look at those. All right so uh, uh, if that's field of view, of course it's not measured in degrees but has to be in radians, then uh, our next field would be center of rotation. And that's for when you're in examine mode, clicking, dragging, and you're not trying to navigate through the scene, but rather just 
rotate the scene in place, keeping a local center and spinning it around. Now, it's, it's very interesting, I think, that um, when we do that, we usually talk about having an object and spinning it around. But what's really happening is quite different, isn't it? I mean, we've defined a 3D coordinate space. We've put things in different directions, different locations. And we're not moving them. We're moving the camera. OK? So when, when my object that I want to examine, and I say, well, let me click and drag and rotate that, you're really not spinning the object. Instead, you're spinning the camera as we look at it from different directions. OK, so that's a helpful uh, uh, refinement, a helpful definition to remember that uh, things stay put. They don't move unless we want them to. Our camera is a moving object. So when we switch to these different modes, that's what's letting us uh, push that little window on the world around. Okay, so that's examine mode. We also have uh, look at, which lets you click and it will seek to something. Okay, so let's, let's examine some of these different modes. And uh, I'm getting ahead just a little bit here in that uh, uh, navigation info is where we describe these a little more thoroughly. But let's check it out. Let's just uh, navigate on this thing. Okay, here I am in examine mode. Okay, so we can tell because of uh, uh, this icon right here. For this browser is the examine icon. And so when I'm clicking and dragging in the scene, it's obviously rotating. And where does it look like it's rotating about? Maybe somewhere near the South Pole. It's not the center of the globe that it's spinning about, but rather it's spinning about the center of that combined geometry. Okay, so if I wanted to try a, uh, a look at operation, here's the seek button here with the binoculars. So I click there and that just shifted my viewpoint to be closer, centered on that point. Notice how my icons change back to a uh, examine mode. So now when I rotate, we're not rotating about the South Pole anymore, but basically we're rotating about the center of the geometry that I clicked on. And the hello world text is still out there somewhere. If I zoom out, I'm using my center mouse button right now. I could also switch to fly mode and drag. That would zoom me out. Now if I go back to examine, you can see we had a slight shift in the center and it's rotating again. But once again, it's, it's, it's keeping our center of rotation where it was reset. In other words, not the South Pole, but the center of the Earth, the center of this little Earth model. Okay, so that's where the look at button can help you change the center of rotation. And this is also where uh, uh, we go, oh, okay, so we have center of rotation. Even though it changes my navigation info, we put it on the viewpoint node because the viewpoint is looking at something when it's initially defined. So that's how we can associate a center of rotation with that viewpoint. It might be quite different for another viewpoint. So that's why we kept it there. OK, what else? Jump is uh, a much trickier field. In fact, I think um, we're going to pick up with this one on the next time. There is an example in the specification for an elevator. And uh, my basic advice to you especially when you're beginning, is don't use this wheel. <laughs> it's very tricky. Uh, what it basically is designed to do is allow you to go from viewpoint to viewpoint uh, uh, without changing position. And 
says it, it sort of silently navigates you to a different offset. So if we had uh, jump equals false, and I was looking over here at some object, and then I change viewpoint to look at some object over here, the viewpoint would not move. We would not jump to look at the other place like we usually do, but rather <coughs> we'd stay there. And the reason why is it would pretend as if you had navigated. Even though your focus of attention is different, it changed your relative view so it didn't move. So when you use jump, it's usually for something that you might be under the hood secretly handing off the viewer from one viewpoint to another, but you don't want them to have a jarring experience. You want it to be a smooth transition. So uh, in the specification, in the example I'll show in the next session, we use that for an elevator where you walk into the elevator, by getting close there, your uh, viewpoint changes, but it doesn't jump. And then when the elevator starts moving, you move with it. Okay, so hints and warnings. You can move a viewpoint around. Uh, sometimes if it's a little too complicated to figure out what is my orientation, just put a transform over it. Further, if you wanna say, swing it around one axis and then look down, you might use the viewpoint orientation <laughs> simply to get one of the rotations and then use a transform to get the other rotation so that you don't have to compute the, uh, the four value axis angle. We have a list of keyboard shortcuts. This is one thing that we have normalized and, and stabilized in the different browsers where they have defaults now. Occasionally you'll still see a mess up where one will go left where the other goes right but we've tried to get consistent. So let's uh, leave on that point about different viewpoints, different views, sometimes look different in different browsers. Reason for this is X3D is a big spec. There's a lot to cover. What we're doing uh, just this weekend, in fact, at SIGGRAPH is we're gonna have a plug fest to see if we can't encourage better conformance, better stability among the browsers. Okay, so there's viewpoint. We'll pick up tomorrow with that jump example, and then navigation info is the next one.